on behalf of the Justice Collaboratory and Yale Public Humanities, I want to welcome you this evening. We're throwing books. Um, so first of all, the normal reminders to silence our cell phones before we get started tonight. After the panel, there will be books for sale in this room over here. So a special thank you to Atticus for being here tonight. And Aaron and Patsy will be signing books after the panel is over. So I would like to take a moment to acknowledge this beautiful space that we're in tonight. Uh, this place was founded by Titus Kafar and Jason Price. We're, we're, we're very sorry that Titus can't be here in person tonight, but he's obviously here in spirit and his presence can be felt throughout the space. Next Haven is helping catalyze New Haven into a world-class, sustainable arts community. Thank you, Susie, wherever you are, for being such a, a host. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> so a little bit about the Justice Collaboratory. We were founded in 2015 by Professor Tracy Mears. Tracy's here as <laughs> our, our fearless leader in all things, and, and Tom Tyler. And some of you might be wondering why the Collaboratory is hosting this vast event. Um, and it's really to bring together um, New Haven to honor the life and legacy of a community member who has memorialized his experiences of injustice through art and through literature. This event is part of the Justice Collaboratory's 2022 focus on community vitality. Winfred's memoir and his art illustrate a primary JC principle, which is that individual and collective well-being are the cornerstones of justice. Now, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the amazing people who are on the stage with me. Um, over the last month, I feel that my life has become infinitely richer by bringing Winfred and his legacy into mine. And Rinfid's life was very much marked by several themes. Art, black history, the written word, oppression, and of course, love. I am so pleased we were able to bring these five people here tonight to speak to those themes of his life. Moderating the panel is Dean of the Yale School of Art, Kimberly Pinder. <laughs> Joining her is historian, professor of American history and African American studies, and JC member, Elizabeth Hinton. <laughs> to my left here is co-author of Chasing Me to My Grave and professor of philosophy at Tufts, Aaron Kelly. <laughs> On the end, we have the one and only poet, founder, and director of Freedom Reads, and JC member Dwayne Betts. And finally, the embodiment of Winfred's love, his wife of 46 years, Miss Patsy Rembert. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and your life is richer as mine has been after tonight. Kimberly, thank you. wonderful slideshow and hearing um, from Patsy and Aaron about my mic's not on can you hear me oh, well I can speak really loudly <laughs> how about that <laughs> it's on now okay so um, I'm gonna pass this back on to you guys who are gonna give us a really great um, slideshow and to talk a little bit about uh, those themes that were mentioned and even more so Aaron and Patsy thank you Thank you so much. It's really a thrill to be here. Thanks so much to the Justice Collaboratory and Yale Humanities, Tracy Mears, Beth Parker, Dana Green, the whole team, uh, my fellow panelists. It's just this is really, really special, special event. And I wanted to acknowledge um, the Rembert family, all the family members that are here, Winford Jr., Lillian, Patrick. It's okay. <laughs> okay, Patsy suggests you stand up. So Winfred yes, Jr. standing already, Lillian, Patrick, 
Nancy, yeah. Justin, Robbie, where's Mitchell? Mitchell somewhere. Yes. And we have a very special guest, Winfred's sister, Lorraine Reeves, is here from Rochester, New York. What? Yes. And Lorraine's daughter, Cynthia, thank you for making the long drive here. It's really special to have you here. Um, so, and Phil and Sharon McLean, without you, this book wouldn't have happened, and I just want to thank you so much. You. And Stephanie Steiker, our literary agent, Stephanie Steiker, who worked so hard to make the book happen. There are just, there's so many people to thank for making this book happen. I was, Patsy and I were interviewed by this uh, journalist, his name is Mark Cecil, and he was really moved by the book. And, and he said, I just keep thinking of all the ways in which this book might not have happened. <laughs> like the stars had to line up. You know, it was just, it took so many people. So it's just, a, it's a thrill. Um, so we, we want to just touch on some of the themes of the book. And we wanted to start by reading a couple of paragraphs from Winfred's preface to the book to give you a sense of, of his dreams and, and hopes for the books. Writing this book has been a lifelong dream of mine. Ever since I was released from prison, I have wanted to tell the story of me. I left Cuthbert, Georgia in chains. It was 1967. I got locked up, locked up as a nobody. Prison made sure I was still a nobody when, in 1974, I was released. Some people in Cuthbert never knew what happened to me. I want people, especially the people I knew, to understand what happened and why I spent seven years on the chain gang. Even though I have wanted to tell my story for years, I was afraid to draw attention to what happened to me in Cuthbert, Georgia, during my lifetime and to me. I was worried about whether or not the people would believe me or care, and whether the real people I named might, in some way or another, I was true how to talk about my search for my mother, love, for my mother's love, um, the bond I felt with passing. But my time in this world is up, so there is no better time. This may be the perfect time. Now that part bothers me because somewhere in him, inside of him he knew that death was not that far away. And he was trying to get his word out to as many people as he can about the hardships of a young black man in the Jim Crow era and today. So I hope that uh, who all get this book, read it, understand it, and take away from it an understanding of togetherness, that we need to talk to one another. We can't undo what's been done, but we can make sure it doesn't happen again. This is Winfred. Many of you in this room knew him. He was born in 1945, and he died in March 2021. The book was finished, but it wasn't yet published. Uh, he had read, we had read the whole book together. He had approved everything and was very happy with, with the way it turned out. This is the first painting I saw of Winfred. It's called All Me, and Patsy is going to explain that in a minute. Um, but I, I happened to come across this painting online, and I just thought it was amazing. The composition, the musicality of it, um, the abstraction, the subject matter, and I learned that it was painted by a formerly incarcerated man. I was, as a philosopher, working on some questions, ethical questions, about problems with the American criminal punishment system, and I became interested in Winford and wanted to hear his story about, the story behind the painting. So I got in touch with him and asked him if I could interview him. 
Um, and we met at McBlain Books in Hamden, and, and uh, he talked to me about, about his experience on the chain gang and the criminal justice system. And the, we, we stayed in touch, and it, our, our, you know, our work together kind of led to this book over several years of about um, three years working on the book. Um, but when I first met him, it was in 2015. So he had a lot of interesting things to say about this painting as we worked on, on the book. Um, I just want to read one paragraph of his words about this painting. He said, with my paintings, I tried to make a bad situation look good. You can't make the chain gang look good in any way besides putting it in art. Those black and white stripes look good on canvas. People can't really tell what they are until they get up close. They don't recognize those stripes as people until they take a real good look. That was my goal, to put it down so you couldn't understand it until you take a real up-close look. That tells you something about prison life. When you look at it from the outside, you can't see what's going on. But when you're up close, you realize what you're up against. Patsy, do you want to talk about the meaning of all me? All me is a picture of Winford and what he told me he had to be. All of those pictures that you see are him. He felt like that's what he had to do in the run of a day in order to survive on the chain gang. And he tried to fit whatever situation that he was being put in in order to maintain some kind of sense of self while he was in prison. This is the same painting before it was dyed. Winfred carved and tooled leather canvases and then dyed them to make his paintings. So this gives you a sense of the, the texture and kind of sculptural quality of his work. And I hope you'll have a chance to look at his paintings before you go so you can really see the texture of them. They're very unusual and um, unique. So Winfred is from a small town in Georgia, Cuthbert, Georgia. And um, as a child, he picked cotton together with Lillian Rembert, the woman who raised him, and Lorraine. And this picture is called On Mama's Cotton Sack. If you look in the middle of the picture, on the bottom, you'll see a little boy on a cotton sack. And that's Winfred being pulled through the fields by Lillian. They lived on the edge of the cotton field in uh, a small house next to the field. And this painting is called What's Wrong with Little Winfred? Lillian Rembert told Lorraine, who was babysitting for Winfred, and you can see her on the porch holding the baby, that if anything was wrong with the baby, she should hang a white sheet, and Lillian would come from the field and attend to the baby. And, you know, just this painting is is painted with such love. It's almost, to me, like that white sheet is a kind of a flag of remembrance and commemoration for the people who were working in the field, including people that Winfred loved. Patsy, you want to tell, you want to tell what the, this, this oh, painting's called? OK, this came to came. Whenever anyone would ask you what time were you going to work or what time you was getting off, that's what you would tell them from kink to kink, because it would be dark, you couldn't see when you left home, and you couldn't see when you got back, because you worked until dark, and you went out before the sun came up. So he, he named that picture kink to kink. This is another version of kink to kink. Yes. And this is Patsy's favorite painting. That is a painting, that is a picture. See, we're from the same area, just not in the same town. But that is a picture from my life. I didn't do very well in the cotton field, but that is a scene from my life that he did that depicts just how they come down through the field to check, to see where you're working, how hard you was working, or how fast you was working. And he's an overseer. So he would come down through the fields to check. He'd be riding on a horse, or either on a tractor or in a truck. But most of the time, he was on horses. 
and that's my favorite picture because of the beauty of the cotton, not because of the feel of the cotton field, but it was just beautiful. He painted a lot of gorgeous pictures of the cotton field. Of course, these are scenes of um, great suffering and hardship for, for the people that he's depicting in a beautiful way. Patsy, can you talk about the colors in this painting? Yes, now that is the sand. That is the color of the dirt. Georgia dirt was red in some places, really red, so it's beautiful to see it. And he was trying to capture that color. And then some of the cotton field, that was grass in between the seat, uh, because he didn't chop it all down or they didn't get it all down, so it was green up and down the rows. Yeah, the last one there. Yeah, green. that one. That was the grass that grew between the cotton rows. And uh, that's the sand. That you figure how anything could grow in it, but it did. Now, this is a scene, and this is going to seem really out there, but it's true. Women, some women, not all, some would have their babies in the cotton field. And uh, they would go right back to work. They would wrap the baby up and put the baby to the side, maybe on a cotton sheet or something, and uh, the dog would babysit to make sure no snake got around the baby to have dogs that babysit. And that is the life of a sharecropper at that time. So Winfred hated the cotton fields, and when he was a teenager, he ran away from the cotton fields, actually ran away from home, and ran down to Hamilton Avenue, which was the black neighborhood in Cuthbert, Georgia, where he discovered all these black establishments, pool halls, juke joints, shoeshine parlors, and a lot of life there. And this depicts Ham Hamilton Avenue. Interestingly, police car right in the middle, surveilling the black neighborhood. Um, the streets are, are lined with the shops that Winford was familiar with. And he, as I said, he, he loved it there. These were really cherished memories. There were these juke joints where people would dance and have a good time, play pool, eat. This is Homer Clyde's place. Winford remembered Homer Clyde with great, great fondness. This is the Dirty Spoon. Winfred said they wouldn't let kids in this place. So he looked through the window, and he, he watched the adults dancing, and he copied their dance moves. And that's how he learned some of his moves. But he loved all the bright colors. Um, ben Shorter's band, this was a swing band from uh, this part of the South that used to perform in Cuthbert until Ben Shorter got involved in the civil rights movement and was blacklisted from some of the establishments where he had been hired to play. Couldn't play for a number of years. Kind of retaliation for his political views. activism, his views. All right, Patsy. <laughs> I want to hear you talk about Dolls Head Baseball. You want me to talk about Dolls? Well, now, Dolls Head Baseball was something that uh, they take great pleasure in playing. And white people would stand out by the fence and watch them play and didn't realize they was playing a, about them. They would uh, collect doll heads and they would put them in a basket and, and when they would throw the doll's head, uh, they would call out a name of the person they worked for, okay? <laughs> Say, Send Mr. Shirley down <laughs> and they throw it down and they hit him just, so look at Mr. Shirley go. <laughs> they had things that they was enjoying, but the people that we worked for didn't understand, how can you be this happy when we treat you so mean? But that was some of the joy that they had. They would, whoever they worked for, when it was their time to throw the ball or hit the ball, that's who they would be hitting. They would hit it hard, too. <laughs> and it would be a lot of fun. Didn't have baseballs, didn't have baseball gloves. They took brown bags and shaped them so, and have a, a rag with, wrapped around the palm of the hand so when they caught it, 
the bag would make a sound. So everything was fun. It was fun. So this is Jeff's cafe where Winfred got a job racking the pool balls. Um, worked for Jeff and he slept in the back room. And this was the place where he developed a political consciousness. The civil rights movement had come to this part of Georgia and people would meet in the pool hall and talk about upcoming demonstrations and they would be trained in the method of nonviolence, nonviolent demonstration and resistance. And Winfrey got very interested in this and wanted to participate in. So he went to some demonstrations in Americas. This is a scene from a civil rights demonstration in Americas that turned violent when some white civilians showed up with shotguns um, and the police started beating on people. And Winfred uh, was being chased by two armed men, picture in the back, and he ran down an alleyway where he saw a car with the keys in it, jumped in the car and escaped. Now he's committed a crime he stolen a car and he was arrested some days later in Cuthbert um, and that was a fateful day um, with many years of incarceration to follow. Um, Patsy, do you want to talk about? Well, no, Winfred, first of all, he didn't exactly run away from home. He ran away from the cotton field. He'd still go back home every so often. but. This was a scene when the deputy sheriff, he stopped this toilet up, like he flooded the jail. And when Winfred the deputy, yeah, yeah. Winfred, and when they come, when the deputy sheriff came down to his cell, he had made up in his mind he was going to take the beating. But he said it got so severe and the pain of him kicking him in the mouth and in the face, uh, he had to retaliate. And he ended up taking the gun from the deputy sheriff. The deputy sheriff asked him for the gun back. He said, no, I can't do that. And <laughs> he locked him up. And he left that jail in the police car. That was not a good idea, but <laughs> he left the jail in the police car. And then he ditched the car, got out, walked down the railroad track till he got to some civil rights people house that he thought would help him. The husband was gone to the store, the wife was there, and he asked her when she opened the door, she said, what is wrong with you? He said, I just broke out of jail. And he showed her the gun. She invited him in, made him comfortable, gave him a cup of coffee, and went out in the back and called the police. Now her husband was coming, was going to Jacksonville, and she had him thinking that if he just wait, uh, he could probably catch a ride with him to go to Jacksonville, Florida. So Winfrey said he missed her. He said he started listening, he didn't hear her, didn't see her, and he got up and looked, and then he went to the front and he peeped out, and there was so many white people out there. He said he don't know how many, but it had to be at least 25 or 30 people out, and it was all there for him because she had called him. And they, knocked on the knocked the door open and asked him where's the gun and he said he threw the gun on the floor and that's when they started beating him they beat him unmerciful he said but somehow or another he endured that beating and then they took him and threw him in the back of the truck in the back of the car took him to the jail where they beat him some more he said, and then while they were sitting around thinking about what to do with him, they decided they'd take him for a ride and they took him, oh my Lord, they took him to a place where they had planned on hanging him and killing him. And uh, the deputy sheriff, once they, he said, when he got there, they opened the trunk of the car. He said, you could see the ropes. He said, it was a nice manicured place. He could see the ropes hanging from the trees. And he just knew they was going to kill him. He said, but they took him out, stripped him off all his clothes, tied the rope around his ankles, and they pulled him up in the tree. And when they pulled him up in the tree, he said he could see the deputy sheriff coming with his knife in his hand. He was going to take away his private parts. 
He said, but just as he stuck him and the blood started running, another white man walked up to him and told him, don't do that. We got better things we can do with him. So that stopped that. He said, whoever this white man was, he just had on wingtip shoes and a brown suit. And that he had to have a lot of power to stop him, just with a word. So that was that part. Yeah, so they marched him back through town. This is called the walk. They took him to court and sentenced him to 27 years. And he served then seven years on the chain gang. Two in jail. This is the first version of All Me. He did a whole series of paintings about his prison experience. I'm just going to scroll through a few of them because we're, we're running out of time. He's in the ditch. In the ditch. Breaking rocks. Yeah. Angry inmates. Winfred self-portrait. And this is Patsy's yard. Winfred was working by the side of the road near her house and came up into her yard. And this is how they met. It was the beginning of a really beautiful love story that's yeah. told throughout the book. I wish we could talk more about it, Patsy, but I, I think we need to wrap up our section. But here they are, 1974. <laughs> On the road outside Patsy's house, two days before they got married. Yeah. This is the first, the first dance. <laughs> And here, here they are later in, later in life. Yeah. Oh, my. And there's, there's Winfred. Point at me. <laughs> so thank you, for, Patsy, for sharing. Yeah. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Now, it's good she cut me off because I can talk about him all day. <laughs> Well, I think we all would love for you. Know, I feel like, oh my God, I'm Debbie Downer here interrupting. <laughs> you have us all unwrapped here with these amazing stories. And I know that um, many of you out here have read the book. I had the pleasure of reading it. And I was saying how I went from the pictures to the text, you know, looking yeah. at, the, at the images and then going through to find the explanations of, of what I was seeing. That was really, really powerful. Mm. Um, and again, I, I think we all are up here feeling honored that you're sharing, sharing so much of this with us, um, as Winfred also shared yeah. so much of his life. Um, and I am sad that I came to New Haven just years after um, he had passed, and I wasn't able to meet him, but yeah. um, I was able to meet so many of you in the family, and I am really looking forward to getting to know you more, um, okay. and more about him through you and um, his amazing family that is here with us tonight. Okay. So I, I think the sharing is one of the most important things that we get from here. You know, you mentioned that this is so much of a, a journey of, of pain, but also love, mm -hmm. and also of sharing. I mean, the the incredible generosity that is in this book, because yes, artists can do pictures, right? Yeah. To tell their story, but also to have this amazing and incredibly poetic narrative yeah. and, and about his life um, is something that not everyone does share. Um, and I have to say for me, um, my parents were raised in the South, and I felt looking through these images was like these memories that they had that they were always trying to impart to me without pictures about picking cotton, about <laughs> the fear of white people all the time living yes. in the South. So my mom was raised in rural South Carolina, my father in Eastern Shore, Maryland. And again, seeing these images, it was as if I was seeing what they were always trying to envision for me in those stories to make me appreciate where I was in yes. time and what they had left in the South, escaped, mm. both of them ran away, um, mm. to the city of Baltimore where I was born. Um, and again, that story about the lynching story, the almost, I think that's the title, uh, Almost yeah. Me, was almost one of those me. other images. Um, I'll never forget what the meaning that my father was trying to impart to me when he said that 
when a white boy spat in his face and he punched him, that was his ticket out of the South. Because mm -hmm. within a week, that's he a had to be gone. Yeah. That's and that's a, why he was suddenly, well, I'd say out of rural South, then he was in Baltimore. Um, so again, that's what I was getting so much, that generosity of those images and those stories that was also resonating with me, that the stories that my parents had told me that were very similar. Yes. So I really appreciate that. Um, one of the things I wanted the two of you, and, and also all of us too, to um, maybe respond to is that generosity of that, those stories of sharing his life um, also reminds us so much of the power of reparative justice, reparative gestures, um, both inside a prison system and outside of it. And we see that here with um, Winfred Rampert's um, images, but I also would love to hear from, from maybe you starting, Dwayne, about that, how do, we, how, how do you respond to that, especially with the type of reparative gestures that you have been involved in? Um, yeah, one, I'm honored to be here. It's just really lovely, and it was just great listening to the stories. I, I, I was like, I was kicked back. I thought to myself, um, man, I've never got to sit on the panel and just listen to somebody else tell me beautiful stories. So, um, it was great to hear. And you, and you know, the funny thing about it, though, is I got this book, and it was like, when do you write a, a blurb for the book? And I was like, nah, I want to write a blurb for the book. And then I started reading the book, and um, the memoirs are, are really hard to write. And I was already upset that I was asked to write it, because I've been in prison, um, and I saw always get asked to write like, blurbs about other people who have been in prison. So I thought, he just asked me to write this, because, you know, Winfred had been in prison, and we never had make a comment. And, and the best of writers, I think, are able to make you remember that it is a commonality to your experience, to their experience. No matter, you know, if you share the same race, no matter if you share the same gender, no matter if you share the, share the same culture. And, um, and what really astonished me reading this was, uh, you said it on the stage, actually, you were talking about cotton, and cotton being beautiful. And it's the greatest depiction of cotton here in this book. And, 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 and what he does, though, is he, he gives this description of the beauty of cotton. And then turns it and shows you the art of it too. But what it reminded me of, um, and I have to throw this book, is the, the necessity to hold the sorrow with the light. Mm -hmm. and, and even when you were telling the story, you did the same thing. And I was like, oh, shit, that's the same thing I read him say. And it was a different kind of connection between the two of you that I wouldn't even have, have imagined. But it made me think that, um, that the artwork grows out of the light. But the writing about the light grows out of the light. And I think that's what we got to, to witness just now, to hear you talking about the light. And so what I found most astonishing was the ways in which I saw parallels and, and what I imagined wanting to do with my life and what he did with his life. And it was on layers of like being, a, being an artist, but, um, but being a father, um, but being somebody who remembers. And, um, and that's why I was really excited, ultimately honored um, to write the blurb. And I was even more honored when the book won a Pulitzer Prize, because typically um, books like this don't win. You know, books like this don't get honored, don't get read enough. And, and it was amazing when I, I got the news um, that he won, because I utterly did not expect it to happen. Not because I didn't think it was good, but because I didn't think that the people who were making decisions would notice. And, and they noticed, and, um, and it's remarkable, and it's only sad that, um, that you know, that we're on the stage and he's not on the stage with us. Oh, I, you know, when you're mentioning about what to do with your life, another thing I thought was so about generosity, I think that's going to be my, my key word for tonight, um, and also meeting some of his children and talking about how you took so many people into your home, you know, that, that, that gift of giving and knowing that it's so, it's so powerful to continue to give because he was always, and you too, Patsy, clearly, were so aware of where you had been. And, you know, and that's something I think really comes through in this book, um, that you always were taking in people and yes. helping them, helping anyone who needed it, even if you had to give up something of yourself, some of your money, some of your clothes. And I think that's 
that sense of, of always understanding what was left to give was really powerful in this book and in these images. So would you like to respond? Yeah, to so um, first I just want to also echo um, others in, in expressing just how honored I am uh, to be here. Um, I'm inspired by you, Patsy. I'm inspired by your family. And I just feel deeply, deeply privileged um, to be in this room. And also grateful to the JC and Public Humanities at Yale for um, taking the time to recognize and celebrate Winford's contributions here in New Haven. And um, that's, that's huge. And I, too, I just really wish that, um, that he was here with us to also celebrate. I know that he is here, but um, physically present with us. I think, you know, so for me, when I think about what's necessary for, for restoration and restorative justice as a historian, right, that's actually understanding and knowing um, the true depths of our history. And um, our methods as historians is to go into archives and you look through documents and you try to piece together anything that you can about the past. And reading Winford's book and his art um, capture things about U.S. history and capture things about black history that an archive never could. Um, I think especially because so much of the book, um, you know, I, I really see it as a, um, as a social history of Jim Crow, um, one of the best social histories of Jim Crow that exists. I was pretty astonished when I read it, and I think it should be required reading for everyone in this country. Um, but the, the conditions of labor very much resembled slavery um, in many ways, even though it's centuries later, right? Century later after abolition. And um, you know, talking about, I was also extremely struck by the idea of people giving birth um, in the cotton field, um, talking about that, but also celebrating the joy <laughs> Um, that happens e even under conditions of oppression. So, um, you know, he also writes about um, the, the beautiful singing in the cotton fields that happen and, and how after, you know, living in um, a white supremacist regime on the weekends, cooking hog's head, mm -hmm. and how that brought relief to the community. Um, the book really helps us understand these kinds of tensions. Um, in, in new and really, really important ways, and I think shows um, how, like the lived experience of white terrorism and supremacy. For me, um, similar to you, Kimberly, my, um, my, my family's from Georgia, and I had heard stories similar to this, but I feel like this book also helped me very much understand my own family better. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm th deeply thankful for that. I guess the last thing I'll say on the justice point is that in addition to really illuminating the deep um, racist logics and injustices of the so-called justice system, I think one of the things that this book does really beautifully is, is show um, the, the kind of larger conditions and socioeconomic circumstances that lead people or leave people with no other option um, but to participate in informal in and illegal economies in order to be able to survive, in order to be able to support their families. And I think that's something that this book um, really, really shows in, in, in vivid and enraging um, detail. That um, as a scholar of uh, mass incarceration and policing and crime, um, I think that, that Winfred has given us a deep uh, contribution in that respect as well. That can also lead to more restoration and rethinking, um, and this is you know key to the work that we do at the JC. What does public safety look like? How can we empower communities um, to think about safety in a new way? How can we understand what leads people to harm other people um, or to participate in informal um, economies and, and transgress the law? Well, I think when Fred Jr., would you like to? Come and talk oh, to I'll us. Say one more thing. Oh, sorry. One more thing, Dwayne. So, one thing that I think is really cool about the book is chapter 15 when it when it's you talking this past year. And what's really nice about it is, I just wanted to mention that like we talk about mass incarceration, and we talk about people being in prison. But what st what struck me was um, you said um, one day I went to see you said um, once I met Winfred and straightened things out with my parents, I told everybody that he was going to be my husband. 
I put a picture of Winfred wearing his chain gang uniform on my coffee table and I said, that's my husband. My intention was no secret, but nobody believed I would do it. And, and, and like one, I think the, the book captures your voice in such a compelling way. But two, I think sometimes we forget that the people who were there supporting us as folks were going through prison and struggling with prison was always people in the community. And I think um, having that, just having that passage in the book is just such a testament, a testament to the future that you saw back when nobody else saw it. And when we talk about all of our ideas about how we need to transform the system, I think um, we should honor the fact that it was people that was with us that was like, yeah, we need to transform the system, but I'm gonna show up for this person that I love today. Um, and I think this is like a beautiful thing that sings out in the book. And, and thank you for sharing, you know, yeah. part of yourself in this book. By one thing, I didn't think when I first met Winford, but through his letters, made if you could read his letters, you could see that he had something special. He he was a terrific letter writer, but at the same time, he was a terrific talker too. <laughs> so once uh, he stole my heart, he gave me the opportunity to dream to have some kind of hope for tomorrow. And uh, that the life we would have, it would be exciting, and that it was. <laughs> it was exciting. I don't say Winford was perfect, but I tell everybody he was perfect for me. He was what I needed all my life, was all I wanted, was him. And we got eight children. Some of them I like, and you know, some of them. <laughs> but I got them, so you get what you get. <laughs> so that's just, you know, that's just family. That's just family. So you know, you got people in your family you don't like. <laughs> But I die about all of them. Okay, that's it. That's it. <laughs>